Um, so I'm going to read a piece of flash fiction. It's right at the edge of flash. It's about a thousand words. And I will just share since after many years of hanging out with writers, I know they like to talk obsessively about process. So I'll just share with you that this, um, the seeds of this started when I was uh, a long time ago, an undergraduate. And this was a poem that wasn't working for a long time and eventually became fiction once I started writing fiction. And I just learned it will be uh, soon published. So uh, stick, to the, stick to it, <laughs> is, the, is the message. Uh, it's called The Science of Silence. In travels, it was not, say, a new species of poisonous fish, an acute shade of green, or a certain drastic temperature the young biologist sought. In fact, it was later revealed that her indiscriminate roaming through tropic and arctic as an enterprising postdoctoral research fellow had, from the beginning, contained a search for a very particular kind of silence, a pure silence, if I can be forgiven the use of that controversial word. Is that working? Yep. After her death, it was discovered that an earlier draft of her seminal doctoral thesis, Carbon-Based Quiet and the Properties of Stillness, had actually contained the word unadulterated in the title. But Dr. Alma Prado came to find the unpredictability of fieldwork frustrating. After months of staking out some corner of Siberia for snow free of human footsteps, a howling wind would crash the depth of silence in a matter of seconds. Her two-year study on the stillness properties of moonlit rocks of the Sonoran Desert was rendered inconclusive by the steadfast crawling of a single satellite across the night sky. That was when she decided to turn to laboratory silence. Shriveled academics who for years had been viciously envious of her sponsored travels, the feature in National Geographic magazine, the adoring students cried hypocrite, for she had always been a proponent of the natural properties of stillness but she, keep, she became convinced that synthetic silence could in fact yield something more perfect than anything nature had to offer. The alchemy of objects, Dr. Prado would exclaim in her lectures. The phrase is still underlined in my notes. By this she meant extracting expectation from owned things. For example, a sweater tossed on a bed, a novel with a few pages folded at the corners. I knew her at the time she was conducting the so-called clocks that stop ticking experiments. You will note, mes chers élèves, she would say, that although these clocks are quite obviously still, they do not present the defined properties of silence. I wrote my master's thesis on a research study that had managed to strip the 17th century grandfather clock of its historic context, place interference, as we called it. One of my regrets at this stage in my life is that I had already left the university by the time Dr. Prado finally managed, by centrifugal force, to remove any sense of what the time had been when the clock stopped, thus defying the very nature of the object, or unstill body. The grandfather paradox was the contribution she thought would bring her immortality. Then came the heyday of neurochemistry. Laboratory silence departments across the country lost their funding, and eventually became thought of as quaint. I believe Buenos Aires is the only place you can follow a proper course of study, including lab work, now. Dr. Prado refused this latest trend. She called it chemical hippocampal onanism, even though it could have led to her finally proving her theories on adulteration. In scientific terms, I know Prado has become a historical footnote, but at least she's still in the book. It wasn't until her biography came out, which explored the details of her scandalous personal life, that people started mentioning her name again in the general public. And most people today, I imagine, will know her from Contaminated by Expectations, the art house film about her love affair with the Mongolian throat singer. Most of her former students tend to be scornful of it, but I like the film, actually, as the burnished version. It's difficult to think of it as Dr. Prado, she always wore her hair short to start, and at that period in her life, she, fa she favored rather unflattering thick lens glasses. In any case, I don't believe a movie could ever represent a real person's life. The film opens with a silent black screen. Then comes the sound of an animal scampering in the snow. The young scientist's face appears bathed in firelight. She is in a yurt in southern, southern Siberia, a snow leopard fur wrapped around her shoulders. She's silent. She's listening to her guide. 
He's bewitching her with the story of the waterfall above the Deer River, where mysterious harmonic sounds attracted the creatures to bask in the waters and were then revealed to humans. He tells her that the way he sings, the instruments his friends play, come from centuries of mimicking the sounds of animals, wind, and water. She asks him to sing, and then he chants, or sings, for a long time, about 10 minutes, too long, a chant with two pitches at once, as if there were a spirit in the yurt singing with him. I think the film included too many episodes of dalliances with her students, but it may have been condensing for dramatic effect. I never witnessed any of the alleged episodes myself. I took her flirting to be universal, a way of being in the world, but perhaps I met her after the rule breaking had mellowed into simply charm, that spark when you made eye contact. The director did do some research on the science, which I appreciated. Contamination by expectations was Dr. Prado's phrase for the phenomenon that caused her adulteration experiments to fail. Even after stripping away a given object's time and place, she could never account for the expectation factor, the one contained in the human mind. The film seemed to suggest that this was connected to her own restlessness, both physical and romantic. Her test tubes grew dusty, her name fell into obscurity. People claimed she had lost her mind, a chemical imbalance, because it did not make sense that someone so charismatic and ambitious would refuse to speak ever again. A metaphorical hunger strike against her age, her decline. But I saw it as the logical extension of her search. She had scoured the natural world, she had investigated the man-made world, with some success, but always with the taint of expectation. She was the only one who could strip this away. The last thing she wrote in her notebook, as reported by her biographer, was the following. Today, I begin a new journey. Henceforth, I will inhabit the dark place behind my teeth and above my tongue. It is a silence that will feed itself. Thank you.